I'm going to talk to you about mind wars on the family. And I'm going to get right to it. Number one, the mental war on the family. The mental war on the family. How many believe there's a war on the family? In America and all over the world. On Friday night, I was sitting at a table with a pastor of a 250,000 member church, another pastor of the largest church in South Africa. He'll be with us in November. Another pastor with the largest church in the Philippines. He'll be with us in October. And another pastor with the largest church in Singapore. And all of them had the same issues in government and with their nation. What the devil is trying to do to the family. It's not just in America. It's global. There's a war on the family because God created family. Come on, talk to me, somebody. Come on, talk to me, somebody. You're going to let me preach because it's going to get tense, ushers. I know NWA just came out. But like Easy E used to sing, nobody move, nobody get hurt. Ushers, lock the doors. We're gonna go, we're gonna, we're gonna heal somebody today. Say amen, somebody. Casting down the high thought of the day about family. I'm going to know a lot of people have opinions of what they think a family is. And the problem right now is if you don't have a sole pr priority or a, if you don't have a foundation of which this is right, this is wrong, then what's right, what's wrong? What's good, what's not good? If you have no fear of God, you have no Bible, well, how do you determine what's sin or not sin? What's good, what's not good? Once the, our nation was built on the Bible, that was the value. Once you take the value out, then why can't you marry your own children? Who's to say it's wrong to have sex with an animal? It doesn't stop. Because there's no longer a good or bad. There's no longer a right and wrong. In whose mind? Man's mind? Man is wicked. We'll abort our children in the womb. We're wicked. You put us up against the wrong area. And the Bible says that when the famine hit, the women ate their children. You can't leave it to man. If you leave society to men, men will eat themselves. Nobody move. Nobody get hurt. Are we good? Are you sure? Because we're going to pray for our children today. And I'm going to build some faith and something's going to happen. Because the devil ain't going to take our children. Somebody say amen. Okay. Paul said, don't be conformed to the world but be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Don't be negatively formed or shaped or influenced by the world. The world has had their minds blinded by Satan. Before I came to Jesus, my mind was blinded. I, I, I called good bad and bad good. And I looked for ways to do more bad that I thought were good because I was blinded. So we can't listen to the educator of the day. We can't listen to the politic of the day. We can't listen to the norm of the day if it doesn't line up with the Word of God. Because if it doesn't line up with the Word of God, then it is not our norm or our normal. It is Satan's normal, but it is not our normal. And Paul warns the church, don't think and become like the world. 
And I'm afraid that that common thought or the high thought of the day is, has infiltrated not only the secular, but it's now beginning to infiltrate the house of God where we're beginning to compromise our values and beliefs to be what? Liked, appreciated, or accepted. But we have never called to be like, we're not called to be liked, appreciated, or accepted. We are called to preach the truth of God's word that Jesus Christ saves, delivers, and if you don't have him in your heart when you die, you don't go to heaven, you go straight to hell. Sorry, but that's the way it is. That's what the Bible says. Well, I don't like it, Pastor. I'm sorry. That's what the word of God says. Hmm. We don't preach like this no more, though. It's too harsh. So is the cross. So is the cross. So was the hell that he went to so you'd never have to. It's good news. It's not bad news. Come on. It's only bad news when you reject him. Can I keep going? The weapons of our warfare, they're not carnal, but they're mighty in God for the pulling down of the strongholds. And the strongholds, watch it, he begins to explain, they are the arguments, somebody say arguments, and every high thought that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And we are to bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. A stronghold is a fortified place or a place of domination and control through the input of parents, Secular schooling, media, experience, etc. Becomes belief systems. Contrary to the word of God. We all have them. That's why when the word of God is preached, you get angry. You get agitated. You get, you get aggravated. Because it's confronting your stronghold. There's a choice that needs to be made. Am I going to change the way I think and believe to fit what God says is right? Or am I going to continue the way I live? But watch me. What happens is if you keep hearing the truth and decide you're not going to change, your heart becomes hardened. And all of a sudden you're hearing it and hearing it and you can even come to church but not change because you've calloused your heart by hearing the truth and not willing to change. You could become a listener and a note taker but not a doer. And you'll never change. Come on, talk to me, somebody. I'm preaching better than you're clapping, but it's okay. We're going to go there. The high thought of the day. What are the high thoughts of the day? The hot topic now is sexuality. Because our kids going, are going back to school, we want to address that. When our, and, and, and we want to address that in the lives of our children. Because it, it, they're going to deal with things that you and I never had to deal with. Am I a boy in a girl's body? Am I gay? If you preach against, if you try to tell somebody they're not gay now, they can sue you for that. And it's sad because you're either, are you a boy or you a girl? I don't know. You, well, it's, 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 physi it's, it's, it's physically impossible to be both. Well, Pastor, we can cut it, we can put it, we can shape it, and you can look like a girl. You can look like a boy, but your brain is that of a girl or a male. You can pump estrogen in your body all you want, but your brain is that of a boy and girl from three months out in the womb. You can't change your brain. And you can't sit there and let a kid make these kind of decisions. You can't let a 14-year-old a or a 16-year-old or a seven-year-old, they don't even, their brain, the, the, the synapses in their brain don't connect till they're 18. The hardest time in a person's life is between the age of 16 and 18. That's the hardest time of their life. Because at that moment, everything is connecting. And they're becoming aware of everything, including their sexuality. And if there's not a parent there to teach them and walk them through it, then the world, the media, the secular, their friends, everyone's telling them you could be gay, you could be this way, you could be that way. Then of course. And then the spirit of confusion step in and, okay, there we go. And then that demon of homosexuality or that demon of perversion or that demon of, of, of lust comes in and it takes over them. And they may not be homosexual, but they're trying to sleep with every girl in the school. She's trying to sleep with every guy in the school because that spirit opened up. And they're not settled. There's nobody discipling them. Their mom and dad are not training them. Matter of fact, mom and dad may not even be there. 
Are we good? We're not gay bashing. Half our staff is gay. There was one time our whole, st- I swear, no lie. There was one time my whole pastoral staff, all of them, like 90% were all gay, ex-gay. And I never struggled with that. But why do they come? Because the love of God. And because they wanted freedom. Come on, talk to me, somebody. So we're not gay bashing. You know, rather, gay bash or homophobic. No. I don't care what you are. I was, I was worse than a gay. I was a, some cochino thing. I was devil. I'm kidnapping and I'm just, come on, somebody. So just a, don't come at me sideways like that. Gay, no, wrong guy. Wrong preacher. But it's about truth. Because our young people are being confused in church. Right here. Am I gay? Am I not gay? Why do I like boys? You got to explain to them. You got to teach them. You got little boys being raised by their mama, no dad. And they're feminine. Maybe I am. I like girl clothes because your mom raised you. She should have taught you to play with G.I. Joe, not Barbie. So now you need somebody to teach you the, the right way. I remember we got a lot of guys come in and they're like, praise God. And I just say, man, you know, my dad never, I never had a dad, never taught me that. And I got, went through all these things growing up. So I just walk them through in love. Come on, this is what it is. Getting people, they come in, getting them married, having children, all that kind of walking them through the whole process. And, and them still battle sometimes, struggle. And to teach them how to walk through that. Just like any other temptation, you got to overcome it. But the world says yield to it. Yield to it. Yield to it. Yield to it. It's who you really are. Yield to it. Yeah, they say yield to adultery. Why not? Yield. You know, there's no virgins. You don't want to be a virgin. Yield. Don't fight it. Don't battle it. It's who you really are. By the time they wake up and figure they're not gay, it's too late. They've ruined half their life. Oh, the devil's going after a generation. But where sin abound, grace will abound. We'll be there for the cleanup, like always. High thought of the day. Here's another high thought of the day. Are you good? You breathing still? Now let me say this. I love homosexuals. I love adulterers. I love prostitutes. I love drug addicts. I love liars, cheaters, and whoremongers. I love them all. Why? Because Jesus died for every one of them. And I'll accept you to come to the house of God to receive your freedom. And we'll journey with you into your freedom. Just like me. Who am I to judge that? I'm the worst person in the world. I did the worst things you could ever do. I was a madman. But God graciously took me through a, a, a process of deliverance. It took me five years to finally come through because of so much craziness. And if I'm not careful, I can go right back. So that's why I always got to be saved. So why some of you make me mad, just pray I don't backslide. See, some people would backslide, they go to the nightclub, I backslide, and I kidnap you. God is good. Pray I never do. Say amen, somebody. Come on, some of you are clapping, and you're like, uh oh. Because, <laughs> you know, it's just real. If I can't share my heart, I can't be real, then, it, you know, that's not going to work. I, I, I'm not a fake guy, I'm not a hypocrite, I can't be that. I've never been that, not even in the world, and I'm not that now. I'm going to tell you the truth. I'm going to tell you what the Bible says. I'm going to tell you what the Word of God says. And that's what the Word of God says. Say amen, somebody. If you're born a boy, you're a boy, you need to like girls. If you're born a girl, you're a girl, and you need to like girls. And boys. See, the Spirit came on me. Amen? I said amen. Well, I don't like, and I'm, I'm not going to argue with you. It's like me saying, you know, God made weed. Got to make coca, cocaine plants. Hey, Dale. give me a piedra, piedra. God made women. I can have as many as I want. 
No. One wife, faithful to the day he died. One husband. Come on, three claps and amen. I'm trying to help a church. Come on, somebody. So you got to train your children this way. Your children can't make these decisions on their own. They, they won't be. Your teenager is not. There's, they have brain damage. Till they turn 18, their brain is normal. And medically, their brain connects. That 16 to 18, everything connects. And that's when they, they became. That's what you ever said a, a, a 16 year old? She'll look you in the eye and say, I love him. She turned 18, she I don't like him no more. <laughs> did she change her mind? No, at 16, she did love him, but she wasn't all there. How many made some decisions at 15 and now you're 50 and you're like, no, you're like 20 and you're like, wow, he's ugly. My God, what was I thinking of? I got three claps out of amen. Come on, talk to me, somebody. Come on, how many did some things when you were a teenager and now you're old, you're like, oh my God. But the reality is sometimes you do things as a teenager and they become beliefs and mentalities and now you're 34 years old still acting like a teenager. That's okay, we're going to work on that. You need deliverance. You need to go to lifestyle of freedom. Say amen, somebody. All right. Can I, am I doing good or not? Because I'm going to preach it anyway, but I want you to encourage me like I'm trying to help somebody here. Amen. Can I keep going? Here, let me give you another high thought of the day. The high thought of sexuality. The high thought of priorities. There's a thought now that and, and people, if you've talked to them, they probably don't believe it, but they, they, by their actions. Some, some people have two and three and four jobs because they want to give their children a better life. And there's some truth in that, but most of it's a lie. Because a kid doesn't need more money. They need more of you. No, 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 wait a minute. What are you worth to your kid? You're priceless to your children. You can't, there's no price tag. You need one job, 40 hours a week, and the rest of the time with your marriage and your children. And you, and you do the will of God for your life. You save souls, make disciples. You get one clap, two, see the high thought though? You see the high thought? No, I don't, I don't, I don't, come on. Because you're going to end up giving them everything materially, but not giving them what they need, and that's character. <laughs> character is not taught in a classroom. Character is taught through discipleship. You have to disciple your children. You have to disciple your children. You have to disciple your children. You have to, but you can't disciple if you're not being discipled. Can I teach? Character is not, your, you can't let the schools teach your, disciple your children. You can't let the babysitters disciple your children. You and I must disciple our children. I don't have time. You better take a pay cut, move to a one-bedroom apartment, do something so you could be there because if you don't, they're going to let somebody else disciple them, and that's when they're going to come out weird, and they're going to bring shame later on to your life. <laughs> Pastor, my kids already brought shame. Then God can restore. But some of you have an opportunity. Your kids are still young where they look up to you. God put that in them to look up to you like you're everything because you are to them. You are the God. To, you are God in their life. When they want to know God, it's you. You represent God in their life. Then you lead them to him. Come on, somebody. And then you say, you no longer need me. You can go straight to him. Come on, talk to me, somebody. That's what the Bible set up. But the Bible says older women train the younger women. Older men train the younger men. Discipleship. Some of you want to run small groups and you want to disciple all these people around you. F listen, men, first disciple your children and then your wife. You can't lead God's house until you disciple your house. Three claps and an amen, but Pastor Jay's preaching good. 
What good is it if we save the world and we lose our wife? We save the world and we lose our children. We become successful in business and we lose our marriage. We lose what's most precious to us, our seed. Am I doing good? Because you can have the nice house on the hill too early. And you did it out of God's time. You did it on your own strength and power. And you lost the best years that you were supposed to sow into the life of your children and your wife. You lost it. Because you bought into the lie of the day. That if you give them more, they're going to be happy. They want you. They want you. My son doesn't want pastor. He doesn't want bishop. He doesn't want fastest growing church in the area. He don't care about that. He wants dad. She don't care about pastor, bishop. She wants her man. That's what I'm talking about. Come on, somebody. Are we good? Give God a praise like I'm praying. Now, God will prosper you. You know that. We believe that. He'll prosper you, but you got to get your priorities straight. High thought of the day. This is the way it works. Five, this is the way it works. God number one, I'm number two. That's selfish. No, because if I'm not good, nobody's good. I've got to keep my health, got to keep my mind straight, got to keep where I'm at. I've got to be solid. God, health, then my marriage, then my children, then the Great Commission, what Jesus commanded me to do, win souls, make disciples, then my career. That's how it goes. If you get it out of order, your thought is not God's thought. You have the world's thought. You got to change your thinking. Some of you don't, some of you haven't led anyone to the Lord in, and you don't disciple nobody. And you're wondering why you struggle. Because you're not taking care of God's business. Whether I'm a pastor or not, I still have to save souls and make disciples. And it starts where? With my children. It starts where? With my wife. And then from there, the people around me that God brings in my world. I can save souls and make disciples. i got to take care of God's house. I, I, it, number one, it's me and God, my relationship. Number two, it's me. Make sure I'm strong, healthy. Number three, it's my, it's my marriage. Discipleship, my wife, my marriage. Being the husband I'm supposed to be. Number four, my children. Number five, saving souls, making disciples. And number six, the church. Pastoring, doing the work. That's my career. Look at people are just like zoned out, whatever. Doesn't matter. Somebody's going to listen to me. Hopefully a young man in the training center is going to listen to me. Come on, somebody. Come on, some 18-year-old going to get a hold of this. By the time they're 40, they'll be a multimillionaire with a hot, beautiful, gorgeous wife. Amazing children. Come on, kicking butt for God. Taking over cities. Come on, conquerors. Is there anybody here that's more than a conqueror? Come on, somebody. I'm talking to somebody that wants to change. Can I keep going? Lay aside all filthiness and overflow of your wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word of God which is able to restore your souls. See, that's what's happening right now. I'm preaching the word of God and it challenges you. It challenges you. It cha when I was in Hawaii, I was being challenged as a father, challenged as a pastor, challenged as a husband. I was being challenged. Was it comfortable? It's never comfortable to change. Because you'll do one, one or two things with change. You'll, 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 you'll resist change or you'll embrace change. Or you will resist her or you will embrace her. Some of you are relate, you're a late embracer, but thank God you're, at least you're an embracer. And some of you fight change. You're mad at me right now. And if I didn't tell you the ushers were going to tackle you, you would have already ran out. Come on, somebody. But like Carlos Santana, I don't agree with his music, but he had a good quote. You got to change your evil ways, baby. Three claps and an amen, but I'm preaching better than you are clapping right now. Look at your neighbor and say, he's preaching to me. He's preaching to me. Look at you. Don't okay. Psalms 1, let's read it. Blessed is the man. Say blessed. Say blessed. Wave at me if you want to be blessed. Wave at me if you want to be favored. Wave at me if you want all that God has for you, you and your family. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel 
of the wicked, nor stand in the way of the sinners or in the seat of the mockers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, he meditates day and night, and he's like a tree planted by the streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, whose, whose leaf never withers, and whatever that man does prospers. I want a prosperous marriage, a prosperous children, a prosperous ministry, a prosperous life. How? By being a man that doesn't go with the world, but a man that goes with the Word of God. It may not be popular, it may not be cool, it may not be common, but heaven and earth may pass away, but the principles of our God will remain the same. And if God said it, and I got to change, and it hurts like hell, then let it hurt like hell today so I can have heaven tomorrow. Come on, somebody give God a praise like God blesses those that are faithful to Him. Number two, and we're, going to bring it, we're going to bring this to a place. And then we're going to pray. I'm going to pray for you, and then I'm going to pray for your children today. When we choose God's mind, we choose the good life. Today I have given you the choice, God says, between life and death, blessings and curses. Now I, now I call heaven and earth to witness the choice you make. Oh, that you would choose life so that you and your descendants, your children's children's children, so your children and the grandkids and the great-grandkids and the great-great-great-grandkids would experience the blessed life of God. you got to come to a point where you get tired of living under the curse, tired of, 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 of children out of wedlock, tired of single families, tired of struggling mentally, physically, financially, tired of the curses. Some of you are dealing with curses because your daddy and your mama didn't break the curse. And if you don't break the curse, it's going to go into the life of your children. And God says, I give you a choice to break the curse. Come on, somebody. The reason I had to face the curses is because my daddy decided he didn't want me and he left the curse in my life. So I had to break the curse so my son and my daughter don't have to live with the curse. I choose life, not that blessing, not cursing. And it's not easy because it's generations of curses in the Lozano family, in the Lozano lineage. There's many, many generational curses on both sides of the family. If I, if I put a list of them, it would probably look, look a lot like your family's. Curses after curses after curse in the city, curse in the field, curse in the coming. Curse. No one stays married. No one does it. Everyone struggles. Curses. Early death. Early pregnancy. All this stuff. Curses after curses after curses. And all those mentalities, watch me, are in my mind as truth. And I get saved and they're still there. They don't change. They're still there. But I got to replace those old memories with new memories. Those old trees in my mind with the new trees by the planet, by the living water. Come on, somebody. So when the, when the old thought comes, the new thought stands up and says, no, I take down that high thought. And I choose to think God's thought. And when I choose God's thoughts, when I choose God's thoughts, I make a decision for life, not death, for blessing and not cursing. That's why Joshua said, as for me and my family, we're going to serve the Lord. I don't know what you and your family are going to do. I pray you'd follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. I pray you follow it. I pray I'd be a great example to you. But as for me and my family, we're going to choose. We're going to choose to put God number one in our marriage. God number one in our family. We're going to choose to save souls and make disciples and bring God's freedom. We're going to choose God's way. And I believe if we do, like Caleb, we're going to enter the promised land. Not just me, but my children are going to enter in. And not just my children, but my children's children. And I believe when I get to the end of my life, I'm going to see my, my children's 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 children. And I'm going to be able to say, you're blessed because I broke the curse. And if you continue to live in God's thoughts and God's ways, the curse the Lozano curses will never come on your house because we belong to a different bloodline. The natural bloodline was cursed. The natural DNA, there was weakness, there was arthritis, there was diabetes, there was sickness, there was early death. The natural curses, but we have broken the natural curses because if any man is in Jesus Christ, he's a new creation. 
and the old is gone and the new has come. Come on, how many believe we are redeemed from the curses of the law? We are set free from the bondages of our past. We are delivered from the wickedness of pre-ancestral curses because the blood of the cross set us free from the yoke of Satan and broke the power of hell when he rose from the dead on the third day in Jerusalem. Somebody give God a shout like you're redeemed from the curse. Three, and I close again. I'm a good Pentecostal preacher. You close 15 times. This is the most important part of my message, though. Can you hang in there for five more minutes? Yes or no? God told Abraham, leave your country. Somebody say, the united priesthood family. I want to be a priesthood family. I want to be a priesthood family. We choose to serve God together. Leave your country, your family, your friends, your father's house for a land that I'm going to show you. I'm going to make you a great nation, Abraham. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make you famous. You're going to be a blessing, Abraham. I'm going to bless those who bless you. And those who curse you, I'm going to curse. And all the families of the earth are going to be blessed through you. All the families of the earth. And so Abraham chose to serve God. And he was blessed. He became a priesthood family. God never intended us for, for us to carry out the vision of saving souls and making disciples apart from our families. He expects us to do it together. He expects us to carry out the vision together. What's God's agenda today? What's God's agenda for your family? When God looks at your family, when God gave you children, why did he give you those children? The Bible says that God gave Abraham his children because he knew that Abraham would disciple them. The word disciple means to child train. He said, I'm going to give you all these children because I know you're going to train them to follow me. I'm, I know you're going to train them to serve the Lord. Joshua said, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. What does serve the Lord mean? In Matthew chapter 28, Jesus said it. He said, the last commandment is this. He said, go into all the world, preach the gospel, and make disciples. That's the commission for every single family in this room. That's the assignment. We bring God's freedom through saving souls and making disciples. That's the vision of God. That's the dream of God for every one of your children, for your family, for your life. You don't get away from it because you're a businessman, because you're a teacher, because you're a politician because you're an educator, because you're a physician, because you're a lawyer, because you're a contractor, because you're a plumber, you and because you're a single mom or a house mom, you don't get away from the Great Commission. If you're a Christian, your life belongs to the Master. The assignment on your life is the same as it is on my life, and that is to save souls and make disciples. And in America, We've left it to the pastor. The pastor is the soul winner. The pastor is the disciple maker. But that is not in the Bible. That's nowhere in the Bible. My job is to equip you. My job is to train you. My job is to prepare you so you can watch me save souls and make disciples. And then your children watch you prioritize the house of God. Your children watch you save souls and make disciples. Not church on Sunday. It's living like every other way all the rest of the week. We put football before God and basketball and soccer and all this stuff. And we leave and neglect the house of God and wonder why our children turn their back on God. Because we disciple them that way. They'll become you. They'll become me. So we try to escape this. Well, I'm going to do my own thing. I'm not going to save souls. I'm not going to make disciples. I'm not going to do what Jesus commanded me to do. What are you saying to your children? If you're saying you could serve God your own way. You could, you could be a Christian your own style. That's not going to work. In this day and hour, it's going to get darker and darker and darker. Oh, Lord. Are you going to compromise like the world? Do your own thing? Not for me and my house. I'm going to train Joshua. He's my disciple. I'm going to disciple my son. I'm going to disciple my daughter. Little Noah, he's two right now. 
He's a tough disciple right now. A lot like Peter. I say, go left. He goes right. I say, Noah, hi. He says, what? Come on, somebody. I say, I love you. He punches me. Come on, but I'm going to disciple him. Say amen, somebody. Come on, say amen, somebody. Come on, that's my seed. Come on, somebody. Say, my wife, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be the hero in her life. Not some other man. I'm going to be the hero. I'm going to be the man of God. When she looks at me, she's going to say, he's cute, but above he's cute, he's a man of God. I love the man of God. Come on, that's what a woman wants. She wants a man of God. Come on, women, clap like you know I'm talking the truth. You want security. You want stability. You want a man that's going to be there when hell or high water may come. A man that's going to speak the word of God. A man that's going to fast and pray. A man that's going to rebuke the devil off your house. A man that's going to rebuke the stress off your mind. Come on, somebody give God a praise. I, I'm believing God is going to raise an army of disciples. And as we are discipled, we're going to disciple our children in the way they should go. Write these commandments that I've given you today on your hearts. Get them inside of you and get them inside of your children. Talk about them wherever you are. When you're sitting at home, when you're walking in the street, when you talk about them from the time you get up into the morning to when you fall into bed at night, watch me, tie them on your hands and your foreheads as a reminder. Write them all over your homes. This is a sold out home, mija. Yeah. We serve God here. We honor God here. And you disciple them till they're 18. And then you've prepared them now. And so when the temptations come from their school and the wickedness comes from around them and all these other people are telling them, hey, hey, you, you, you should do this and you should do that. And this is the way your, your kids are going to be solid in their ways. And they're going to say, no, I don't have that kind of need in my life. I have a father, I have a mother, I have the family of God. I don't need that. I've already got that net. That's a lie. That's wickedness. Come on, talk to me, somebody. Somebody give God a praise. Like, and some of you are there saying, Pastor, it's too late. My kids are all growing up. What do I do now? You pray, you fast, you believe God. But you start going forward with God. Can I believe it's never too late? I believe God can still use you to disciple your 50-year-old. Come on, somebody. Some of you got 30-year-olds, and they're going to come back home talking about, I'm ready to come back home, Mom. I'm ready to come back home, Dad. I've been wayward. I've been backslid. I've been serving the devil, but I'm ready to turn my heart around. I'm ready to change my life. Come on, talk to me. That's what happened to me. That's what happened to me at 20 years old. At 19 years old, I decided the world wasn't working for me no more, and I came to the house of God, and they discipled me, and they raised me. Come on, talk to me. How many love the house? house of God the place where disciples are made the place where souls are saved Psalms 133 says how good and pleasant it is when there's unity the key to your victory in your home the key to the priesthood blessing is unity husband is a soul winner husband is making disciples hard working man but not too, working too hard where he neglects his family. He's got his priorities straight. He's not perfect, but he's, he's striving for that mark. He's striving for that maturity. He's striving for that next level. Wife following behind her husband. Come on. She's striving to be the mom she should be, the wife she should be. If she has to work, she's not working too much. She's where she needs to be. She's a soul winner, a disciple maker. She's starting with her children. Come on, somebody. She's discipling those little youngsters. She's teaching them the ways of the Lord. She's teaching them how to behave she's teaching them how to dress come on she's teaching them how to be nice to each other and not fight and not argue come on talk to me she's discipling them come on and all there's a unity in your home and in your home you open it up to a small group come on and now you're saving souls and you're making disciples and your children start looking at you come on and all of a sudden 13 year old says you know what? I want to be a disciple maker you can be a soul winner and a disciple maker all of a sudden instead of generational curses and alcohol and addiction and we're not going to church on Sunday because we're going to watch the game. No, we're going to the house of God. We're going to bring people and save souls. There's a unity in this house. There's a flow in this house. Somebody give God a praise like pastors preaching better than your clapping today. Discipleship. I, 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 I'm, 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 I'm so convinced of this so much. This is how we're supposed to do it. This is God's way. He said, man, nobody does that, and that's why so many are jacked up. We're going to do it God's way. 
We're not going to build the church on hype. We're not going to build it on conferences. No, we're going to build the church by one family at a time. By you discipling your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren. Come on, talk to me, somebody. By you discipling your wife. Come on, and being the, and, 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 and being the wife to your husband. And you can trust him now because he's a man of God. I know some of you are like, man, I don't know, but just, he's, if you just keep serving God, that trust is going to come back. And when the trust comes back, then the romance comes back. Cover your ears, church, children. Come on, talk to me some. Come on, Marvin Gaye comes back. Say amen, somebody. Some of you married 10, 15, 20 years, and all the romance has gone. The devil is a liar. How many know God is a romantic God? Amen, somebody. He wants you to love that woman. He wants you to love that man. Come on, more in love than you've ever been. Say amen, somebody. Say amen. You don't, yeah. I feel this spirit of when a man loves a woman. Ready, I'm ready to go home. Come on, somebody. The devil is a liar. God is good. Say, God is good. He blesses you. And I believe God's going to raise up a church that's going to break the curses. And they're going to raise up generations of blessing. Hi, how you doing? I want to take a minute and I want to talk to you about the power of partnership. In the book of Philippians, chapter 4, verse 19, Paul the Apostle said something very, very powerful that has changed my life, and I believe it can change your life. He said that my God would supply all your need. Paul did not say that their God would supply, but he said that his God would supply. Because the Philippian church partnered with Paul, Paul realized something very, very powerful, that the same blessing that was on his life was now available to the Philippian church. And that is a very powerful spiritual principle. And I want you to pray about this principle, about partnership. If you feel in your heart as you pray to partner with this ministry, I believe that this anointing that's on this ministry, which is the anointing to bring freedom and to restore lives, will come into your life. It will come into your family. And I believe the next thing you know, you're going to experience the same freedom that thousands experience every week. As you partner with us, I believe the same anointing that's on this house is going to come on your house. The way you can partner is, number one, pray, and number two, give. You can give online, you can give through mailing, wherever you feel led to do that. But I do believe the same blessing that's on this house will be on your house. As you commit to pray for us, we commit to pray for you. And I believe the same freedom that's in this house is going to come to your house. We love you. God bless you. We'll hopefully hear from you soon. Bye-bye.